Welcome back! Now that we've tried a couple of different designs, we've had a chance to see what works well and what doesn't. Let's try to figure out what happened and why. This design and redesign process is an important and exciting part of engineering. An equally important part of engineering is studying what work has been done before us. The knowledge of what has worked in the past is a great starting point for coming up with new and better designs. These new and better designs often come from our imagination. There was a lot of imagination that helped engineers go from this Model T design to some of the concept cars we see today. Engineering imagination is a large part of what moved the first airplanes designed from this to this. Imagination is undoubtedly very important, but our world would not have all of its innovations if it were left to imagination alone. As engineers, we design new and exciting ways to improve life, not only through imagination, but through studying the science that goes into everything we do and all the engineers that did work before us. Now, before we get involved in any project, we want to base what we try off of what we already know from past research and from the underlying scientific principles. With our planes, for example, we took what we know about physics and the design of airplanes that have worked in the past, and we designed our own. Certainly, we can use our imagination to come up with all sorts of interesting wing designs, but some of the basic principles of flight will remain the same because we know they work. And by looking at all the things that we know that fly, we could see what they all physically had in common, which helped us build a plane. And then we identified three forces that they all experienced during flight to help us build a better plane. Again, those forces were lift, which pushes our plane up, gravity, which we identified would pull our plane down, and drag, which is the force opposing our plane's motion as it moves through the air. In the interest of getting a better understanding of how our plane flies, let's take a closer look at lift and learn what it is, how it acts on our plane, and how we can use it to make our plane fly more efficiently. In the first video, we talked about how lift acts almost entirely on the wings of the plane. So it makes sense that we start there to gain a better understanding of what is happening to the plane and the effects that lift has on it. But first, let's do a quick experiment that you can try at home that will show you lift. You'll need a sheet of notebook paper that is thin enough to hang over as you see here. You'll hold it just below your lips. You're going to blow down towards the top of the paper as Jess is doing here. Do you see what happens? The sheet of paper starts to rise. What you're seeing is lift. You're not blowing the paper up, you're actually blowing air down the top of the paper and the air underneath the paper pushes back up as a reaction. To better understand this, we're going to run another fun experiment. For this experiment, you'll need the following things. A small fan, a protractor, a piece of wood, poster board, scissors, a metal skewer, pencil, marker, glue, and tape. First, take the poster board and cut out a piece that is three inches by nine inches. Next, draw a line a quarter of an inch in from the edge, then fold the card in half. What we'll do next is push the top layer until the edge of the card meets our quarter inch line. This is where you will glue the fold down. What we have now is an airfoil. The airfoil is the shape of an airplane wing. This would be a side view of the airplane wing. It's important to point out that while this airfoil will help us illustrate lift, this curved design is not necessary to generate lift. Just as we showed you earlier when we blew on the paper, a flat wing, like the one on your model plane, is also capable of generating lift. Right. The reason we are using this cambered design, or a design having an arched surface, is that the shape is most efficient in generating lift. So now that we have our airfoil, we're going to poke a small hole that goes through the top and bottom of the airfoil. The hole only needs to be big enough so that we can slide it up and down the skewer freely. What we'll do now is thread the skewer through the airfoil. Using a ruler, 
dry line on the wooden block that runs down the center. Next, we'll take our block of wood and attach the protractor to the back of it like this so that the protractor is flat and the protractor center lines up with the mark we drew. With this setup, we can see how the lift changes on our airfoil at different angles. Now place the wood block in front of the fan, as you see here. We'll place the rod on the line and hold the rod at 90 degrees, or straight up. What you've basically created here is a wind tunnel and airfoil. But before we turn the fan on, watch what happens as the airfoil is dropped without any movement of fluid around it at the 90 degree mark. We see it drop straight down with very little resistance. The same is true at a larger angle. The angle between the cord of the wing and the relative wind is known as the angle of attack. Now, let's turn our fan on and see how the airfoil performs. We'll want to look at how much lift the airfoil generates at different angles. As we start at the 90 degree mark on the protractor, our airfoil is at a zero degree angle of attack. When we drop the airfoil, we see that there is a little lift as the airfoil descends more slowly than when the fan was off. As we increase the angle of attack, we start to generate more lift. The greater the angle, the greater the lift. So you would think that if we give our airfoil a very large angle of attack, we would have the most lift. But as it turns out, this is not the case. So why is that? It turns out that a large part of what generates lift is when air moves quickly over the top of the airfoil. We mentioned before that turtles fly in water. Well, just as water, the fluid that turtles fly in, flows over the top of the turtle's fin, air, the fluid that planes fly in, flows over the top of our wing. As the air flows over the airfoil, it is deflected downwards. And as a result, there is a force that pushes upward just as in the experiment we had run earlier when we blew over the paper. Right, but after a certain angle, the air no longer flows smoothly over the airfoil. If we look at this wind tunnel demo, we see that after a certain angle, the air no longer flows over the airfoil. Without the air deflected down the wing, there is no air pushing up. And without air pushing up, there is no lift. So we have an ideal angle of attack that generates the most lift by allowing the air to flow down the wing. Beyond this point, the wing generates no lift and causes the plane to go into a stall. So taking what we know about angle of attack, it makes sense that we would want our plane to balance out in flight in a way that allows for an ideal angle of attack. This angle would be bad because our plane would stall or loop and tumble. This angle would be bad because we would not be able to generate any lift, or the lift would actually be downward, and the plane would dive. So now that we know how lift works on a wing, let's revisit our center of gravity discussion. Looking at our plane as a scale again, we see that the center of gravity is the point in which the plane will pivot. We had tested adding weights to the front of the plane and added paper clips to the back of the plane. Doing this, we moved the balance point relative to the wing. This, of course, makes a big difference in how our plane behaves now that we know that lift acts primarily on the wings. There are two variations at this point. This is the neutral position we want our plane to be in in flight. If the center of gravity or pivot point is behind the wing, as it is in this first case, we see that as the wing begins to generate lift in flight, the plane begins to pivot and turn upwards. The lift is pushing up on one side of the scale, which takes the plane out of its neutral position and increases the wing's angle of attack. Increasing the angle of attack will increase lift. The lift in turn will increase the angle of attack even further until finally, the plane does a flip or just stalls and crashes. In this second variation, we added enough paper clips to shift the center of gravity to the front 
By putting the pivot point of the plane in front, we create a negative feedback system, where as the wing creates lift, it pivots the plane, turning the nose of the plane downward, making the plane less angled, which decreases the angle of attack, which in turn decreases the amount of lift and returns the plane to its neutral position. This prevents the plane from going out of balance. And that, Jess, is how we build an efficient glider. Wow, we covered a lot of information today. Yeah, we did. So basically, all of the flyers have three forces working on them. Gravity, lift, and drag. Right, and in every case, it would be ideal to balance the flyer around a pivot point or center of gravity that takes into account how lift affects their balance. Exactly. Because lift pushes up on the wings, we have to think about how lift will affect the angle of attack. Which is why we want the center of gravity to be in the front where the lift occurs. Brilliant. Yeah, it really is. What you did today with your model airplane is a large part of what we do as engineers. There is so much interesting math and science that goes into the work we do every day. And the more we understand this math and science, the better we will be at what we do, and the more creative we can be in how we do it. When we built our first planes today, we didn't expect that they would fly perfectly, and chances are it didn't. But that's part of the discovery process. It's part of the learning process, and it's a beautiful part of engineering in general. Your plane may have crashed a lot, but like the Wright brothers, you went back and worked to understand why things didn't work, and you re-engineered a more efficient glider. But to be honest, today wasn't just about making a model airplane, making it fly farther or stay in the air longer. It was about seeing something that may not work exactly right the first time, and then finding a way to make it better. That's what engineers do in the real world. You see things just like everyone else, and then imagine a way to make them better. You have a lot to be proud of, so go out there, fly your planes, be curious. And we'll see you next time as we explore the exciting engineering world around us. Bye! Bye.